Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North. My guest on the show today is an internationally recognized leader when it comes to bridging science and spirituality. And he's a best selling author, and I'm so honored to have him on the show today, Bruce Lifton. Now, being a stem cell biologist and a former medical professor and research scientist, he has studied in great detail the mechanisms by which the cells receive and process information. And the implication of these, this research radically changes our way of understanding life. Bruce, I'm thrilled to be having you here. Welcome to Wisdom from North. Sonica, I am so honored to be on your show, and I so appreciate what you do because you offer the world some new information and new science that will help us evolve because we're, we're going through an evolutionary crisis right now when you look at the world and it seems like it's falling apart. It is falling apart, but that's not the bad news. That's the good news because if we continue the way we've been on this planet and continue doing just what we're doing right now, uh, extinction is just a really decades away. We are so undermining the, the planet in which we live, it will no longer support us. So basically it says, if you want to survive, then we have to stop this doing and begin doing something completely different because what we're doing is self-destruction at this point. Right. I was actually going to start with something else, but while you're saying this, uh, I think we can start with uh, the three like misconceptions of, uh, of life that you've been talking about that can lead us to extinction. Can we go into that first? There are actually four beliefs that we have built the culture on based on, oh, this is science, so we should live this way, and then, of course, everything will be great. Unfortunately, those four beliefs are wrong, and, and so we've been living into a science that is, is wrong, and as a result, we have unknowingly been self-destructive because we're not living in harmony with the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when these new beliefs become part of the world's understanding, because they're leading-edge science, uh, when these new beliefs become part of our understanding, then it means that we will change the way we will live on this planet to accommodate the new belief. So uh, just to list them, uh, one of the biggest beliefs that we have a problem with is uh, the belief that science has been operating by, it's called Newtonian physics. And that was the physics of Isaac Newton. And that physics specifically said there's a mechanical, mecha material, physical world. There's an energetic world. Um, the world, according to Newton, was the, uh, there are two different realms. There's the invisible energy realm, and there's the physical mechanical realm. And in the physics of Newton, the two energy and matter don't talk to each other. So that if you want to understand life, life is physical, so just live by physical rules and ignore the invisible energy. So we live in a mechanical material world. That's why everybody um, is, is trying to get all the material possessions that you can get. How much matter can you own uh, is like the rule of that world. And so that's why everybody's out trying to get things because our belief is more things, more power. Well, we have been destroying the planet, <laughs> getting all those things. And it turns out there's a new physics. It's actually not even new now. It's a hundred years old. And that physics is quantum physics. And it's completely different because quantum physics says, yes, there's an energy world and there's a material world, just like Newton. But the difference is quantum physics says the energy world controls the physical world. So if you leave out the energy, the invisible stuff, then you're missing what controls life. Mm. So quantum physics says, bring it back together again. And when we bring back the energy, the invisible stuff, uh, which is interesting because in physics they call the invisible world the field, F-I-E-L-D, the field. Lynn McTaggart wrote a book about the field. And I, I say, why is that? What is the field uh, by definition? And the field by definition is invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. That, that's from physics. The, the field is invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. I go, it's the same definition for spirit. Spirit, invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. Well, spirit's never been science because quantum physics wasn't here. But now that quantum physics is here, it says that invisible stuff that people in history have talked about, you know, thousands of years ago is actually real. And if you understand it, 
you can uh, really uh, adjust your life and adjust your health and your behavior and have more power over your life. So it's really a return to spirituality in the terms of quantum physics, which is the invisible forces. Okay, that's one mistake. So we throw out spirituality. It's like you can't throw out spirituality. It's more important because it's what shapes the physical. Yeah. So we have to bring it back. Uh, number two. Uh, we have been, as a world, believing that genes control our lives. The belief is that genes control us and we don't control the genes. So if you have like cancer running in your family, that belief is, well, I'm sorry, you're going to get the cancer. There's nothing you can do about it because the genes control you. Well, that makes us victims, victims of our heredity. Meaning, if you have a disease running in your family, then you think, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm going to get that disease and I can't do anything about it because I cannot control my genes. So we were teaching people they were victims of their genes because they couldn't control them. But that belief is now, that doesn't, that's not true anymore. There's a new science in the last, well, since 1990, and it's called epigenetics. I said, well, it sounds like genetics. I go, yeah, but it's very different. Genetics, when I say in the book, let's say science book, genetic control, we're talking about, oh, control by genes. Yes, my life is under genetic control. My life is controlled by genes. Well, the new science is called epigenetics. And you go, well, it sounds the same. And I go, no, no, epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, I am saying control above the genes. And it's like, well, what controls the genes? And now we know the environment, and more importantly, our belief or our perception about the environment. So in other words, rather than being victims like we believe we are, oh, I'm going to get cancer, or I'm going to get Alzheimer's. It's like, no, no, you can change all of that, but you have to recognize your belief and your thoughts, they are controlling your genes. And that makes us very powerful if we know that. If we don't know it, we could kill ourselves with bad beliefs, and, and that's what we're doing in the world right now. We, uh, we have to change the understanding. We control our own genetics, and if we change our beliefs, we change our genes. This is how, like, what, uh, when someone has a terminal cancer, let's say, and everybody believes they're going to die, and all of a sudden they have a, what's called a spontaneous remission. I go, well, they had cancer, they were going to die. Now they have no cancer. What happened? And the answer is, they had a change of belief about their life. Most people, for example, if I tell you, I'm sorry, uh, if I'm a doctor and I tell you, I'm sorry, you, you have three months left to live. And, they, and the doctor says, go home, take care of your final issues and get ready to die in three months. Most people will do that and most people will die in three months. But there are some people who say, well, if I only have three months left to live, I might as well go out and enjoy myself. I might as well let go of my problems. I don't need to do work. I don't need the, the stress. I don't need any stress. I'm just going to go out and have fun. Well, guess what? They go out and have fun. Then one, two, three months, four months, five months, a year, and they have no disease. And I said, well, what happened? And the answer is, when they let go of the stress, they let go of the disease. 90% of illness and disease on this planet is due to stress. Well, why is that relevant? The answer is, well, if you know it's due to stress, you're the one that can change the stress. That means all of a sudden you can control your health. Yes, that's the new biology, epigenetics. Let so me that's ask you two. something. Like if, yes. if I would have, uh, have, have um, cancer in my family and you wouldn't, for instance, have cancer in your family, would it be uh, more likely still that I could get cancer or isn't it more likely that I get cancer? It, it would all depend on how we... Okay, here, let me tell you a story and then we'll fit it, fit it in. They, the scientists were looking at what happens to children who get adopted into a family that has cancer, okay? They find that the adopted child will get the same family cancer, just like any other natural kids. But the adopted child doesn't come from the same genetics. That's totally different genetics. So the question is, well, how can they get the same cancer? And the answer is, because the way we see the world, which I talk about as perception or belief, we are programmed in the first seven years with beliefs. 
And if those beliefs are not supporting you, if those beliefs cause stress, then your life will be expressing stress because you're going to be operating from those beliefs. So when a child is adopted into a family, it learns behavior. But if the behavior is stressful behavior, then the child learns stressful behavior. It will get a, it will get a disease, not from the genetics, but from the programming. Now, um, the Catholics, the Jesuits, have for 400 years, for 400 years, the Jesuits have had a saying. They say, give me a child until it's six or seven, and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. Or they say, give me a child and I will show you the man. What were they saying? They were saying, if I can control the program in the first seven years, I control your life. If I teach you to be a member of the church, I don't care what you want. In your older age, you will always be a member of the church because you're coming from your belief. Well, they knew that. They knew that your life could be controlled by your program. And they knew that for 400 years. And, and most important, that knowledge didn't disappear. That knowledge is way valuable that governments and control agencies have known the same thing for 400 years. And so we have been programmed to be not powerful people. We have been programmed to be weak. Why? Because leadership doesn't want powerful people to control. Leadership wants weak people to control. It's easier. <laughs> And that's what the whole issue is about. We have been controlled and programmed to believe that we are not very powerful people. And the truth is completely opposite. I mean, people can walk across fire if they believe it, but you can't do it if you don't believe it, okay? Uh, in my lectures, I, I show a, a, a strong man with muscles, big muscles, lifting up a car, sweating and you know, lifting up a car. And then I show articles about women who lift up cars when their child is under the car or a friend is under the car, a woman can lift up a car. No, no strong woman, no muscle woman, no. Just any woman who is in the belief that I must lift up this car, my child is under there, and doesn't question, can I lift up the car? It just, they lift up the car. There's many, many, many articles. I go, why is that relevant? Because if I said to you right now, Jonica, go outside and lift up your car, you go, what, are you crazy? I go, no, no, go out and lift up your car. And you say, can't do it. And I go, if your child was under that car, I wouldn't even have to ask you to lift it up. You would lift it up. And I go, well, that means you're really more powerful than you believe. And I go, exactly, exactly. And, and so this becomes very important that what we believe about ourselves it is actually going to control our biology. If I believe I'm weak, then I'm weak. If I believe I'm strong, I'm very strong. But that's probably the problem that we don't know our beliefs. Like you're, you know, talking about that ninety-five percent of our lives are controlled by our subconscious. So we're not even aware that we have these beliefs. Well, we do. If we, you see. The, the whole idea is this. You say, well, what controls your life? And I say, your beliefs control your life. You say, well, oh, my conscious mind is part of my belief. Well, conscious mind is connected to you, your personal identity, your spirit. Who you are is in your conscious mind. Subconscious mind, 90%, is a machine. It just records behavior. And when you push the button, you play the behavior. It's like habit. That's what it's called, habits. Okay? Well, the idea is... Science has said, yes, our mind controls our lives. I go, yes, that's true. But then here's what people don't understand. The conscious mind is the creative mind, the one connected to your identity, your spirit. I go, yeah, that's the one that has wishes and desires because it's creative. If you, if you ask the subconscious mind, you, you, if you could talk to the subconscious mind, you say, okay, what will happen next week? The subconscious mind can't think ahead. It can only know what it knows right now. It doesn't see. It just does right now. So the conscious mind is always in the present. The subconscious mind is creative. Tell me what you're going to do next week and your mind can start thinking. I go, why is that relevant? Because the conscious mind being creative is the mind that has, what is a wish? It's a desire. I, I wish this. I, I don't have it, but I want to create it. So a wish is a creation. A desire is the creation. Okay? So I say, ah, then your conscious mind has your wishes and desires. And I go, yeah. And then I go, but the conscious mind can think. That's the problem in the whole world. 
because when you're thinking, the conscious mind's not paying attention. So I ask you right now, I say, uh, uh, Jonica, what are you doing on Sunday? If you actually try to answer that question, you're going to have to think. You're going to have to think about, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? I go, when you are thinking, you're not paying attention to oh. what's going on right now. I say, think about next Thursday. Well, you're not seeing what's here. You're thinking in your head. I go, ah, so here's, here's the problem of the whole world. Ready? The thinking mind is the wishes and desires what you want from your life. It is the creative mind. But when it's thinking, it's not paying attention. So I say, yeah, but if you're walking down the street and then you are thinking, does that mean you stop? Everything stops while the thinking is going on? I go, no, no. If you're walking, you continue walking, you can think. If you're driving the car, you can think and drive the car. I go, yeah, but if you're thinking, you're not paying attention. I go, yeah, but the subconscious, a subconscious mind is one million times more powerful than computer, more powerful than the conscious mind. I say, well, well, what happens? And here's the final understanding. When the conscious mind is thinking, it's not paying attention. So behavior is defaulted or shifted to subconscious program. Okay? And I go, well, why is that important? And I go, because the important subconscious programs we got from, as the Jesuits knew, from the first seven years by observing other people. You observe your mother, you observe your father, you observe your family. I go, why is that relevant? Because the behavior that you're downloading isn't your behavior. It's their behavior. This is how the cancer in the family occurs in a child. In the first seven years of that child, they observe the mother and the father. If their behavior is not in harmony, if their behavior is stressful, and they get sick, well, that's the behavior that you have. <laughs> yeah. Because you download from them. And I go, why is that relevant? You say, well, I don't, I'm not going to listen to my subconscious. I'm going to create my life with my conscious mind. And I go, yeah, but science has shown that 95% of the day, 95% of the day we're thinking. Well, that means that 95% of the day you are defaulting and playing subconscious programs. And many of these programs, psychologists will tell you are negative, disempowering, self-sabotaging. These are not good behaviors, and you're playing it 95% of the day. If your conscious mind is thinking, by definition, it's not paying attention. So when your subconscious is running the show because your conscious is thinking 95%, you're the one that doesn't see the behavior. Everybody else can see it. So in my lectures, I, I give a story, and everybody laughs because they're very familiar. And I say, but this is the most important story in the whole world. And here's the story. I say, Go back to a time when you were younger. I think you probably had a friend and you were very close to your friend. So you knew your friend's behavior very, very well. But you also knew your friend's parent. And one day you see that your friend has the same behavior as their parent. And you get excited and you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And then you back away from Bill. Because Bill goes crazy and says, how can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because they're familiar. And I go, that's the most important story in the world. For this reason, we are all Bill. How, did, how come Bill didn't see his behavior? And the answer is because he only plays his dad's behavior when he's not paying attention. So he's the one that doesn't see it. Everybody else sees it. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I go, oh, he got the behavior from downloading it for seven years. So he got his dad's behavior. But he only plays it when he's thinking, which is 95% of the day. And I go, why is that relevant? Because it says, we are all Bill. Every one of us, every day, playing 95% of our behavior from our subconscious program. So we're not living the life of your creative conscious mind, your wishes and your desires. You're living a program. So there's a movie called The Matrix. And, and people say, oh, that's a science fiction. I go, no, no, Matrix is a documentary. It's yeah. a true story. We have been programmed. And that's and scary. Idea. 
Uh, I mean, uh, Riz, I saw a talk with you online and you talked about how our lives were driven by our subconscious most of the time. And I was like, but what can we do? I was so frustrated. What can I do with that? How can I, you know, become conscious? Because I've been doing this for 34 years now. Like, yes. what to do? I, okay, so here, here's, the, here's the interesting part. The programming starts actually before you're born. Programming occurs in in the in the womb. Really? Because the mother's the mother's chemistry of her emotions, if she's happy or scared or sad or whatever, that's chemistry, and it's in the blood. And I said, why is it relevant? Because the mother's blood is what crosses the womb and nourishes the baby. I said, well, yeah. Oh, so nourishment is in the mother's blood and the baby gets nourishment. I go, yes, but emotions are in the mother's blood. And the fetus experiences the emotions. If the mother is happy, the fetus is bathed in chemicals of emotion that are happy and be safe and life is beautiful. If the mother is afraid, if the mother is scared about the future, if the mother is not sure about the relationship with the father, what does that mean? It means that she's living in emotions of fear or, you know, or, or threat or she's afraid. I go, yeah, the chemistry of fear crosses with the nutrition. <laughs> so the fetus, if the mother is afraid, the fetus can feel not safe, insecure. And so the mother's emotions, not just once, but it has to ha happen repeated because that's how we learn repeating it. So the mother repeats the same behavior the child will learn the emotions from the chemistry, not from the words or what's going on, just the chemistry. See, so a baby is already being programmed, okay? Now, now the issue is this. So I say, well, you were programmed from the womb through first seven years. And so I say, John, okay, tell me the program you got when you were one year old. And you go, I, I wasn't there. I don't know what the program is. And I go, well, here's the story. And this is the fun part because here's what you can do about it. 95% of your life comes from the program. So the idea is your life is a printout, a printout of your program. What works for you in your life comes in because you have a program that accepts that. But what you try to do, what you work at, I'm trying real hard. I'm sweating over this. I'm working real hard. I go, why are you working so hard? And the answer is, because whatever you haven't been able to get is primarily because you have a program that doesn't support that. Your unconscious, you can, your unconscious programs are your life. So if you have trouble in the relationship, it's not the world that has trouble. It's your program that doesn't support a relationship. So if you're like Bill and you, and you have a bad behavior because your, your parent has a bad behavior about relationship, well, your subconscious has that same relation, that same behavior. But you can't see it. So you go out, try to find a relationship. It doesn't work. And then you think, oh, the world is not my friend. I go, no, no. Your own behavior, like Bill's, that you can't see is what is causing your problem. So we are creating our lives. But on 35% of what we create comes invisibly from the subconscious, which is not even our program. It came from our parents and our family. So if your life isn't working right, it doesn't mean that you're a victim. It just means that your program is yeah. not supporting that end. It seems and if like, you understand it, yeah. yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking out loud that it seems like uh, it's a destiny in a way then, you know, that... Uh, it's kind of uh, it gets pre-planned like uh, when i'm born through my mother i have no choice of you know uh receiving her patterns and feelings so no no you got it it is destiny that's why let's say when i say oh cancer and you say it's a cancer gene because it's passing through the family and i go no no destiny is passing through the family yeah. the program the program is giving you the cancer not the gene the gene does not cause cancer i mean let's say for example uh, uh, um, uh, Jolie, what's her name? The the actress, uh, 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 Anjali Jolie, or something. Yeah, she's Angelique. the one that had a mastectomy. Maybe because she said that she has a cancer gene in her family, and so Anjali Jolie, and she cut her breasts off. She says, "Well, now I cut off the breast, I won't get the cancer." And I go, "The gene never caused the cancer. 
the gene that she's talking about, the, they call it the BRCA1 gene. That's the BRCA gene. 50% of the women that have that gene do not get the cancer. And you say, well, why is that important? I say, well, having the gene didn't give you the cancer. 50% of the women have the gene. They don't get the cancer. So the gene didn't itself cause the cancer because if the gene caused cancer, then everybody with the gene would get cancer. But the fact is 50% of the women don't. I said, well, what's different? Their lifestyle, their behavior is more in harmony than the ones who got the cancer because their lifestyle was stressful. It was the stress that caused the cancer, not the gene. So we have to give people an understanding that you are very powerful. And if it's not working your way, it's not because you have a destiny or a gene. It's because you have a program. Yeah. Since we know we can change the program, then we know we can take back power over your life. Right. How and, can we do that? that okay. Yeah. That's what I want to know. You ready? You ready? Yeah, you ready? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Almost everybody out there has at one time taken over the control of the program. Uh, the, most everybody in the, in the movie The Matrix, they say take a blue pill or take a red pill. Uh, take a blue pill, life goes back into the program. Life is always the way it is. I say, take a red pill and you get out of the program. And they, but they never say, well, what happens if you get out of the program? Well, I will tell you because almost everybody has taken the red pill, whether they knew it or not. I say, what is the red pill? I say, when you fall in love with somebody big time, where you fall head over heels in love, you're just so in love. And I say, no matter how bad your life is, up until the moment you met this person, your life could be really bad, but you meet this person. And then it's heaven on earth. Everything is beautiful. Everything is love. Everything is energy. It's like heaven. You created heaven. And I go, well, what was the difference? And science now knows. You ready? It's the one time where we stop going to, to the subconscious program, where we don't default to the program. For we stay what they call mindful, meaning when that love is in front of your eyes, you don't think and, and let your mind go somewhere. If the love is in front of your eyes, you keep your attention right here. You stop thinking. And I said, well, what happens when you stop thinking? I said, well, then you don't default to the program. Then I say, yeah, but what mind is controlling you? I say, the conscious mind. That's the one that controls you. I say, yeah, but that's the one with wishes and desires. I go, oh, then when two people fall in love, they're not playing the programs. They're operating from wishes and desires. I say, well, what happened when that happened? I say, they created heaven on earth. It's the one time you didn't play the program. And I say, what did you create? And they say, you created heaven on earth. So I say, well, what would happen if you got rid of the bad programs? You would have heaven on earth every day for the rest of your life. Because the honeymoon, which is the heaven on earth part, only lasts for a period of time for most people. And then regular life comes back. I say, well, what happened? I say, because... The honeymoon is as long as you keep your conscious mind present, being mindful. You keep it present, you're operating from wishes and desires. I go, yeah, that's what your behavior creates. And then I say, yeah, but even when you're in a honeymoon, you still have to have a life. You gotta, you have a job. You have to pay the rent. You have to fix the car. You have to think. I say, oh, what happens if you start thinking? I go, oh, then you start to play the programs in the subconscious mind. I go, yeah, but. Those programs are, most of them are negative. I go, right. This is why the honeymoon is so beautiful because I'm not operating from negative programs. I'm operating from positive wishes and desires. I manifest wishes, desires, heaven on earth. But if I start thinking, I start playing programs, not my programs, my father, my mother, or something. So just for example, uh, I'm with my partner, Margaret. We're having a honeymoon. Everything is beautiful. Love is everything is beautiful. But at this one moment, I'm thinking about, oh, what am I, uh, what do I have to do at work? I'm thinking about what I need to do at work. And, and she comes up and asks me a, a simple question. And, and I'm thinking, and she asks me a question, and then I turn around and go, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me and goes, who are you? What kind of behavior is that? And the fact was this. Remember, if I was thinking the behavior I play wasn't mine, it was my father's, let's say. Number two, because I was thinking, I didn't even see what I just said. So when she says to me, what kind of behavior is that? 
I'm thinking, what's she talking about? Why? I didn't even see the behavior because I was playing subconscious program, okay? And that behavior was my father. That's not very good behavior. Now, she looks at me and goes, we've had this wonderful relationship, but that ba- that's a bad behavior. But she goes, okay, I compromise. Sometimes Bruce is like that. Sometimes she's like that. So, okay, I compromise. And that's only one bad behavior. As time goes on, more and more thinking, more and more programming from the subconscious. The more programming from the subconscious, the worse the behavior because it's not mine. And the relationship starts to un- untangle. It's, it's everyday life. We went back to regular life again. I said, well, wait, I had a honeymoon. I created heaven on earth. Then I went back to regular life. I said, what was the difference? The answer was, once my conscious mind starts thinking, that's when I start playing the negative programs. If I stayed mindful, which is very difficult, we can rewrite the subconscious programs. And I go, well, imagine this, Jonica. Imagine if you took all the negative behaviors that you have and replaced them with the positive wishes and desires of your conscious mind. So your subconscious mind has the same programs that your wishes and desires are. Well, then it wouldn't make a difference if you're paying attention because you'd be operating from wishes and desires. Or if you're not paying attention and you start playing subconscious, it'll still play the same wishes and desires. That means if you rewrite the program to include your wishes and desires, you can have a honeymoon every day of your life for as long as you live on this planet. Because you created the honeymoon with your behavior and you lost it when you defaulted back to your programming. So the simple reality is we can have heaven on earth as well. once we take that red pill. <laughs> once we get out of the program, we are creating heaven on earth. That's our destination. So we have to learn at this time in our history to understand what our negative programs are and to rewrite them. Because if we do, we take back the power. If we take back the power, then we become the creator of our life. But to rewrite them, uh, do we, for example, need to do hypnosis then? I mean, to really go into depth of the psyche. Yeah, well, we would do, but here, but there, there, okay, here's a problem that has faced everybody forever about changing the program. Number one, we've always believed that the conscious mind and the subconscious mind are connected to each other. So if the conscious mind becomes aware, we expect the subconscious mind to become aware too. And I go, no, they learn in different ways. The conscious mind is creative. Being creative, it can learn in many different ways. Read a self-help book. So I'm in a a lecture and I say, how many people read a self-help book? Everybody raises their hand. And I say, how many of you, your lives changed after you read the self-help book? And almost all the hands go back down. I go, well, but you know the content of the book. Because if I give you a quiz, you can get 100. You know what's in the book. I said, well, if you know what's in the book, why didn't your life get better? And the answer, the book educated the conscious mind because that's how it can learn just by reading a book. But the subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. So what's the, what's the point? My conscious mind gets very smart, but my subconscious mind has the exact same program it's always had because it didn't learn from reading the book. It doesn't learn from watching a video. It doesn't learn by going to a lecture. The, sub, the subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. The conscious mind does. So all of us have really smart conscious minds, but our subconscious minds are the problem because it doesn't learn their habit minds. And I say, well, you yeah, see, here's important about a habit. If you learn how to do if you learn how to habit. If you learn how to do something, you don't want to forget it. (laughs) Let's say uh, you learned how to walk. Well, now it's a habit. You don't have to think about it. When you were an infant, it took you a long time to learn how to walk. So do you want your habit mind to change? So one day you wake up and you say, oh, I forgot how to walk. No, uh, I never want that habit to change. I want to be able to walk from now until the end. Unfortunately, (laughs) if you learn a bad habit, it's there all the rest of your life until you rewrite it. And I go, well, it doesn't learn the way the conscious mind learns. I go, that's the problem. The subconscious mind learns in three ways. During the first set, uh, seven years, it learns by hypnosis. hypnosis. A child just watches, excuse me, 
Yeah, yeah. No, just uh, repeating what you're saying. I was just surprised that you said by hypnosis. Well, that you see, the, the brain, the, if I put wires on your head and I could read your electrical activity, we call that EEG, electroencephalograph. There are many different levels of vibration. There are low vibrations and higher vibrations. If you look at the, at the graph, the low vibrations, the higher vibrations are consciousness. The lower vibrations are not consciousness, especially one called theta. Theta is imagination. A child is in theta as the predominant brain activity for seven years. That's why a child can mix the imaginary world and the real world. It's just all mixed together because they live in theta imagination. So uh, you want the broom and the child is riding the broom like a horse and you say, give me the broom. And the child goes, what broom? This is a horse. This isn't a broom. At that moment, for that child, that broom is a horse. So they mix the real world and the imaginary world. That's called imagination. That's theta. But theta is also hypnosis. Yeah, that makes sense. So that while the child is not thinking, consciousness is a higher vibration. That, the child doesn't get that vibration until seven. And that's why... The first seven years are programmed because the mind is in hypnosis. It watches the mother, it watches the father, it watches the family and records, just like a video camera, everything that they see. So the behavior that goes in for seven years is not from you. It, it, you got it from observing other people. It's their behavior. So the behavior in your subconscious, the basic behavior, is not you. Okay? Number two about that. This is, this is critical. This is super critical why we have so much problem in relationship. And here's what it is. During that programmable period, a parent acts like a coach of a sports team. When a coach of a team is, is trying to get the players to do better, the coach yells at them, you can do better than that. That's not good enough. Who do you think you are? You don't deserve this. These are the things the coach says. Now, the team player being older knows, oh, the coach is just saying that because the coach wants me to do better. So the consciousness is, I interpret the coach. He, he's saying these negative things because I'm not performing well. I go, good. That's thinking. But if a child is under seven years of age, the child is not thinking. It's just recording. If the child is in hypnosis, the child is just recording what the parents said. Almost all of us have such negative programming about who we are. We're not lovable. We're always being criticized. We're not good enough. The parents are yes. All these issues. And, and the idea is the child's not thinking, why is the parent yelling? The child's just recording. Not good enough. I don't deserve things. I'm sickly. I'm not lovable. And I go, why is that important? I said, well, that goes into the subconscious program. And I go, then why is that important? Because then... 95% of the day, your behavior will match that program. In other words, let's just say um, uh, you're a student and you've heard your whole life, you're just average. You're just an average student. You're not a good student, but you're average. And you go take a test. Guess what? You're going to get a C, average grade. And I say, what about an A? I say, how can you get an A? Your mind already said you can't get an A because that you're only average. So you know what we do on exams? Even if we know the answer, the subconscious mind will put the wrong answer down. And the reason is this. The mind has to match the program. And so the idea is the subconscious will make your life match the program. And if you were, like almost all of us, criticized as a child, then here's the biggest issue on this planet. If you can't love yourself, then by definition, you cannot be loved by somebody else. Somebody says, I love you, Bruce. And I don't love myself. I go, how can they love me? I'm not good enough. And they say they love me. So they, their words can't be true. Because uh, how can anybody love somebody like me? That's the subconscious, not the conscious mind. That's the one that's working 95%. Yeah. And I go, well, if most of the population can't love itself, then by definition, most of the population cannot find true love on this planet. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We have to rewrite these programs. And if you're having trouble finding love, it's basically not because love is not there. It's because 
unconsciously, 95% of the day, we are playing behavior that we don't see that will cancel any love in your life. So to be able to rewrite the subconscious mind, um, I've heard you say, you know, um, uh, you have to train yourself. To rewrite the subconscious programs that are not supporting us, by definition, and you could initially teach the subconscious the way the subconscious learns. The first way it learns is hypnosis. You want to teach the subconscious? Then use hypnosis. Right. You go, well, what kind of hypnosis? I go, every night as you go to bed, the vibration of the brain goes from higher consciousness goes to low. So every night, just before you fall asleep, the brain goes through theta. That was the hypnosis part. So if you put earphones on at night, and you have a tape playing with a new program, every night as you go to bed, the new program is playing while you're in theta, as you're going to sleep. And so therefore, putting a tape on as you go to bed, that's called auto-hypnosis, self-hypnosis, subliminal tape, that's the word. Um, This is a way of training the program. So every night, put on the new program that while you're falling asleep, new program is going in the subconscious. That's one way. Number two, after you're seven, you can still learn new pro- programs. Of course, we learn a lot of new programs. You learn how to drive a car. <laughs> you, you learn uh, mathematics. You learn how to do multiplying tables. Two times two is four. Two times four is eight. Two times eight is 16. You memorize. If you want to change the subconscious, then you have to practice a new behavior. You actually have to do it, <laughs> and you have to repeat it every day, just like religious thing. Every day, you got to repeat the new behavior. And by repeating it, and repeating it becomes a habit. So when you first do it, it's not really working. You say, uh, you know, like, I love myself. Uh, because I tested before. I tested with muscle tests. But I didn't love myself. So I say, oh, I'm going to teach myself I love myself. I say, the first day you look in the mirror and say, I love myself, the subconscious mind will go, well, that's a joke. <laughs> the subconscious mind say, I don't believe that. Uh, because you don't. You don't believe that. But if you say it every day, every day you get in front of that mirror and you say, I I love myself, you say that every day. And at some point, you won't have to say it because the subconscious mind has repeated it, made a habit. And you will behave in a way that now you will treat yourself better. So not being critical of yourself. That's how you do it. So one, hypnosis. Two, making a habit and repeating it and repeating it, even if it doesn't sound right. You have to repeat it because you're training the brain by repeating it. That's how it learns. Repetition, repetition, habit. Okay? Number three, and this is the most important one for me. There's a new branch of uh, psychology. It's called energy psychology. Uh, It's also called belief uh, modification techniques. And these are ways to push the record button on the subconscious mind. And you can download a new belief in minutes. BruceLib.com. There are a resource page. And on that resource page, I list maybe 20 different ways of the new energy psychology. They're all about the same in some way. And they're all a little different. But you pick the one you like. (laughs) And these are ways of making it fast. Ten minutes. You can take a belief that you've had your whole life. And in 10 minutes, rewrite the belief. Otherwise, if, the, if it's not one of those three things, it's not going to work. If people sometimes they say, well, I'm going to talk to myself. I'm going to give myself a good yelling. I'm going to yell at myself because that's really bad behavior, Bruce. And I think that's really stupid. So don't do that behavior again. I'm yelling at myself. I go, yes, you're yelling. But who are you talking to? You say, well, I'm talking to my subconscious. They go, ah, that's the problem. The subconscious is a machine. It just makes a recording and you push a button and play it back. There's nobody in there. Conscious mind, you're in there. Subconscious mind, machine. It's all it is. Yeah, I'm just realizing that uh, it's so important, this information, you know, that, that we get this knowledge, that we become aware of this, so we can, you know, start working with it. Because it's a huge, uh, well, to me, uh, it's not an easy fix. Uh, because I've, 
you know, been open to these concepts and I've tried to apply them and just, you know, that one thing to love yourself, that's not easy. But I do believe in my heart that if we all truly loved ourselves, the world would look different. Absolutely. 100%. It's exactly what it is. And that's how simple it is in the end. Because when we look at the world today, for many, it looks like hell. And I go, that wasn't, that wasn't the gift. The gift was to come here and, and live a honeymoon. Yeah. What, because when you live in that love, when you first touch that love, and all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, this place is so beautiful. And it's heaven on earth. I go, that's what the intention was for us to be here in the first place. And so when you look at the world, I say there's two ways to look at it. One, regular everyday life, and it's like the scary place. <laughs> and I say, two, look at it as if you just fell in love. And you're just falling in love. I say, oh, that's a different world. I go, yeah, that's a, it's a real world when you're doing it. <laughs> it can happen. You can have that real world every day. And that's that's what my book, The Honeymoon Effect, is all about. The Honeymoon Effect is how did we create such a beautiful world when we fell in love? And the answer is it, it's mechanical. It's not magic. <laughs> it's not new age woo woo. It's science. And if you understand the science, you can have your power back. 90%, let's say, the population of this world wants exactly the same thing. They want peace. They want harmony. They want love. I go, if 90% of the people empower themselves, then the world would be exactly what that is. I've always thought that there's got to be a bridge between spirituality and science. I just knew it in my heart. And this resonates with me so much. And I think we're moving into a time where we will be aware of these things, where we will feel powerful and really start being conscious about what's going on here. So I think, I mean, I have uh, hopes for the future. And I think you do as well. That if there's a heaven, I believe it's right here, right now. Because I've created a completely different life by changing my programming. And, I, and the idea is if I can do it, and I didn't do it because of new age. I can tell you that. It wasn't like, oh, that's a great idea. No, I did it because there was a science. You can cause any disease to go away. That cancer can go away. That's how spontaneous remissions occur. That's because no matter how close they were to death, the moment they change their mind, boom, their lives change. Well, this has been beautiful, Bruce, and so inspirational. And I'm so happy that you gave me and the audience these tools that we can actually apply because that's really, it's good to have some tools, you know, and the understanding. Uh, and uh, I know, you know, people have all thoughts about new science and everything, but I'm thinking if we can have an open mind, you know, try it out and see if it works, maybe it can change your life. And that would be something, wouldn't it? So that, 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 that is something that could be something that is something because how many people I have now since, what, 20 years to teaching this, the numbers of people whose lives, just by nation, knowledge is power. <laughs> Without this knowledge, you have no power. Yeah. This not powers you. So what, I have seen so many people have taken their, their lives back, turned them around, turned in what was a disaster into uh, you know a beautiful life on this planet. What from changing the belief, not changing the biology, not changing the genes, not changing the chemistry, just changing the belief. And and this is what we need to have because it's always been this way. I mean, from ancient times, what we believe we become <laughs> and, and, and it's been repeated every, you know, every century for a thousand years. This, this has been always repeated over and over again. When are we going to own it? The answer is. We better own it now because there's not a lot of time left. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, we we got to get it into the school because this is the true knowledge to me. You know, this yes. is true knowledge. Well, thank yeah. you so much. I can speak with you for hours, but uh, because there's so many things, but I think we covered this, you know, this subject uh, really well. So thank you so much. And you're now in New Zealand and have a good time over there and enjoy. Oh. I, I, it's just another part of heaven on earth for me, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, so I come here for their summer and then I go above the equator for my summer back up north. So uh, I, I really love the summer. Why? It's growth. Yeah. It's happiness. It's health. And uh, so we should all seek that at some point. 
And uh, I would love to come back sometime in the future. We'll pick another topic because there's so many different topics. I'd really and, love to. I have so much to ask you about because I'm so curious. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we can take that another time. I would love that. I would too. So thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank everybody out there that's watching this because every one of you has an opportunity to change the world, change yourself and take back your power. Uh, and uh, by even just watching this program, which I really appreciate, uh, you represent cultural creatives. These are the people that will make evolution. These are the people that are going to let go of the old beliefs and start operating from new, powerful beliefs that, that will help you. So everyone in your audience right now, Jonica, is, is representing the future of our planet, the evolution of our planet. And I want to thank them for listening because this is an opportunity to get some of that power, some of that knowledge yes. to take back control of your life. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you so much for watching, guys. Much light from Oslo. Bye-bye.